presence of the Lord today. Amen? On this summer Sunday morning. You know, summer's an interesting time. People going and coming and vacations and uh, temptations and all those things that come along with summer. Today it's good to have with us Administrative Bishop Ron Martin and his wife Rochelle. Uh, we're always honored when they're with us. And of course, uh, he'll be with us the uh, third week of July for the uh, Church of God camp meeting, a little later in the calendar this year than other years. Uh, and I tell you, uh, the push is for a move of God. It's a powerful night speaker going to be with us most every night. And uh, we're, just, uh, we're just excited about the blessings and goodness of the Lord. Uh, again, Bishop Martin will be coming after a while to, to greet you. Uh, tonight, or tonight, <laughs> this morning, I want to share something with you that probably you've never heard before. Not really. <laughs> Twenty some years ago, I was praying and just reading the scripture, and I came across a passage of scripture that impacted me in that moment and it drew me deeper into it to the point that back then I think I took uh, either 12 or 16 weeks and talked to you with that backdrop. Since that time I have preached this message sometimes a little different probably two or three times through the years and today I want to take you to the banks of the Jordan River one more time. Through Gilgal, through Bethel, through Jericho, and to the Jordan. And I want you to pray with me specifically that the Holy Spirit will speak to us. You know, in a setting like this, uh, people are at different places in their walk with God. Those joining us through live stream only intensify that. And I don't know, I can't see and tell exactly where you are in your pursuit of God, but I can tell you this passage we're going to consider has, uh, you know, I say this from time to time, I have a relationship with this passage. It has spoken to me, it has guided my life on multiple occasions, reminded me of a lot of things. And, and I want to pray that the Spirit of God will speak to you individually and to us collectively. So would you pray with me before we look in the book? Father, thank you for holy divine truth and Lord we've already asked your blessings upon this but Father I, I, I just pray each person give us ears to hear and to hear with understanding and perception that we might take the word and that we might receive it until it become flesh in us speak to us together I pray Lord as we lean upon you in this moment and once again, everybody said, Amen. In just a moment, we're going to look into 2 Kings chapter 2. But before we do, I want to lead you to that place. It's fascinating. If you look at 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah will go through a gamut of emotion by the time the chapter has concluded. It begins with him finding himself on the hit list of a wicked queen named Jezebel. He flees and, until he finds himself under a juniper. Now, you know, we call a juniper tree, but it was a low bush, and he would be up under a bush. And he cried out to God to take his life from him. I don't know if you've ever been in a place as desperate as that. But Elijah prayed for God to take his life. The angel of the Lord came and ministered to him. He was eating and drinking and resting. And he went to Mount Oreb and went into a cave to lodge there, the Bible said. And the Lord, the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, if you have your spouse or your, somebody in your family ask you a question like that in life, that's one thing. But if you have the voice of God speak to you and ask you, what are you doing here. Why are you here? 
And then God sent him to the top of the mountain and he saw the wind that rent the mountain, the scripture said. But God was not there. The earth began to quake and shake, but God was not in the earthquake. Fire was manifested, but God was not in the fire. But then came a still small voice. And the Bible said when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. And after all of that, the Lord said a second time, why are you here? And so God then gave Elijah directions. He gave him an assignment of a king he was to anoint and other things that he was to do. And out of that experience, he he comes on this journey. Now, the last few verses of chapter 19 he walks by, and this is just, it's, some things in the Scripture are funny to me. This is funny. Elisha is plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Now, 12 yoke of oxen, so he's not just strolling along in the field. He's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. And the Bible said that Elijah came by him and cast his mantle on him. Now, that's kind of weird in its own right. That doesn't, I don't know if that happened to you this week at all. But the Bible said then Elisha turns to Elijah and says, I want to go tell my family goodbye, and I'm going to come and follow you. And this is also funny. Elijah says, what do I have to do with you? Now, this he just threw his mantle on him. And then he says, well, what do I got to do with you? So here's what happened. Elisha goes back, and the Bible said he slaughtered two oxen. He boiled their flesh. He used the equipment to build the fire. And he fed the flesh to the people. Now, what he's doing is getting rid of plan B in his life. He just burned up some of the family business. And he came and ran after Elijah. Now, when he comes, he follows Elijah for some some time. We don't know how long. But we come to chapter 2 in 2 Kings. And they're in this place called Gilgal. And Elijah says to Elisha, I am not going to stay here. Let me tell you something. In your walk with God, there are always transitions in your development, in your maturity, and in your pursuit of him. And if there's not, you've been stuck. And Elijah says, I'm not staying here anymore. And so Elisha says, I'm not staying here either. And every time I read this passage, there's this side reference to the sons of the prophets that are looking on. There's always sons and daughters that are watching to see what's next. How you you live your life, how you behave, how you prioritize, how you choose, how you manage your life, they're always watching. They go to Bethel. And Elijah says to Elisha, I'm not going to stay here in Bethel. I'm going to Jericho. And Elisha says, I'm not staying here either. I'm going with you. So they go to Jericho. And then when they get to Jericho, the Bible said that again, Elijah says, I am not staying in Jericho. I am going to Jordan. Say that with me. I'm going to Jordan. So the ultimate landing place is going to be Jordan. Jordan is significant. By the time Elisha finishes this journey of pursuit with Elijah, his life is going to be dramatically and radically different. But the journey began in in a place called Gilgal. Now, it's interesting that the name or the word Gilgal means rolling or wheel. It got its name, ironically enough. In Joshua 5 and 9, the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. So in the beginning, Gilgal was called wheel or rolling because of this magnificent act of grace that God did for his people. But as time went on, Gilgal forgot its glorious birth. 
And if you study the scripture and you look, you find that in Joshua chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, it was in Gilgal that they ate the old corn. The Hebrew, or the word there means the kept over. They, they ate the leftovers of the corn. And the manna ceased. That that God was pouring out of heaven stopped in Gilgal. And then in Hosea 4.14, Amos 4.4, 4, and Amos 5.5, 5, the Bible talked about the idolatry that was in Gilgal. So, you know, when I, when I first began to read this, I thought, why is God so specific? Because God is not a God of happenstance. And so when he is mentioning Gilgal, Bethel, Jordan, Jericho, he's, he's naming these names, there's got to be a reason for it. There's got to be a purpose for it. So I begin to understand that it began in this place called circles. And I've preached to you through the years, and it happens to us in the course of our walk. It happens to us individually. It happens to us collectively that we just get stuck, and we're just going in circles, going in circles, going in circles. It's too hot in the sanctuary. It's too cold in the sanctuary. It's too loud in the sanctuary. It's not loud enough in the sanctuary. Dear God, those lights. Dear God, that fog, or whatever you call it. And we just get, we get so consumed with these things that the world around us is going straight to hell without the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but we're just going in circles. And by the way, don't get mad at me today because everybody's been stuck and everybody's had a problem with something. Everybody gets tagged up with something. That doesn't, that, that, that's just the way life is. But when you get stuck... Because all these things, if we get consumed with them, they begin to affect our growth and our walk with God. Stuck. Idolatry. Eating off yesterday's blessings. Dear God, help me. What God used to do, what he did do. <laughs> you shouldn't be shocked by it. First Timothy chapter 4, this is what the Holy Bible said. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 said, The Spirit speaks expressly. Now, when you hear a phrase like that in the Bible, you need to perk up your ears. The Spirit speaks expressly. That in latter times, some shall depart from the faith. It didn't say they were going to leave church. It didn't say that they were not going to keep saying, I'm a Christian. But they would depart from the faith. Man, I don't want to get down a side track here, but... but I got something in me the last couple of days studying the, the Nicolaitans, who it, it don't cost you anything to come to God. Just come get everything. Just have a good time. My Father, help us. The, the, the leaven of the Nicolaitans is all around us today. There are so many churches that don't preach anything. They don't stand for anything. Anything goes. Let's everybody be happy. We're going to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And I'm going to preach that to you sometime in the next couple of months. But here's what we've got to understand. The Bible said that they would depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Huh. We are living in that day right now in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. After in verse 2, Paul told Timothy to preach the word, to be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, he said, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust will they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall be turned away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul said this know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, fierce, incontinent, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure 
more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. In the book of Amos chapter 8 and verse 8, the Bible talked about a famine in the last days. Not a famine of eating and drinking, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. And if there's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord, there's a famine of somebody somewhere speaking the word of the Lord. And my brothers and sisters, we are there right now. And so we're living in those days where people get stuck. Churches get stuck. There is no anticipation. It's mediocrity everywhere. The mundane rules the day. Lost joy. No strength. No power. Uh, discombobulated. Disconnected. And that's where a lot of people live. They wander in and out of churches, never applying the Word of God to their life, wondering why it is that they're so shallow in their faith and they're so weak in their faith. Uh, the Bible told us that these days would come and when you're you're stuck. You're just roaming around in circles in, 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 in Gilgal. Oh, um, gotta be. You know, we as a church have had our Gilgal moments through the years. Some of which I can't speak of for I'd offend people. There have been times in the last 29 years that I've been pulled away from the vision of the church to have to deal with strong flesh. You know, I wish I could stand up here and just let the good times roll. <laughs> but integrity won't let me do that. But there have been times over the years, and then, you know, I remember there was somebody threatened to kill me and a couple other people in the church. And, you know, when you threaten to kill the pastor, you probably stop going to church. I'm probably going too deep over the line. Just to give you an idea. So the sheriff is going and collecting guns and things from this person. Person stops coming to church. And you know what the good church folk do? They start complaining and criticizing the staff. Because so-and-so's not coming to church and they didn't go visit him. That's because he didn't want to get shot. <laughs> but you can't get up and say that in the middle of it. I could tell you stories. Mm, help me, Jesus. I do feel a little freedom today. <laughs> All the bishops saying, pull it back, pull it back, yes. Man, I could tell you some things. I have prayed so deep and long on occasions for discernment of people because I can't tell it, Holy Spirit tell it, but we have no, not much discernment today. We've had our Gilgal moments. But I tell you, every time, there's always a time when Elijah is saying to Elisha, don't stay here. Because there are churches that have been stuck there for years. Nobody's saved in their altars. Nobody is reaching out to anybody. Nobody's got harvest ties. But thank God, how can we be stuck? How can we stay stuck when God has promised in Joel 2, 28 and 29, it's to come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on the servants and the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. I look in the book in Proverbs 1 and 23 he said I'll pour out my spirit to you and make known my words unto you in Ezekiel 36 27 he said I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and shall do them in Hosea 6 and 3 he said of the Holy Spirit he shall come unto us as the rain as the latter and former rain under the earth in Isaiah 44 and 3 he said I'll pour water upon him the 
that's thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I'll pour out my spirit on your seed and my blessing upon your offspring. And then into Acts chapter 2, there they were, 120 strong, and they were seeking the face of God and magnifying the Lord. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filling all the house where they were sitting and cloven tongues as a fire set upon each of them. And the Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Hallelujah to God. When you get stuck, there is a fire of the Holy Ghost that will move on you and make you free. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then Jesus. I fell in love with him long, long time ago. I fell on my knees and I didn't hardly know how to pray. And I said to him, Lord, if you'll, this is how I prayed. I don't even know today how theologically sound it was, but I said, Lord, if you'll change my heart. I will serve you the rest of my life with the same passion that I have served the devil up till now. Sister Ruth, it just felt like somebody took a big fire hose and put it on the inside of me. And I felt all that debris and all that junk and all that stuff that had held me in bondage. Just come on. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Just get washed away. I hugged everybody. I wanted to tell everybody I love you. There was something real, something different that changed my life. It wasn't a momentary act of emotion. There was a transformation by the power of an eternal cross that changed my life forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't get over how he loved somebody like me. Come on, preach it. Now, I know many of you were good all your lives. And, and maybe God got a bargain when he got you. Not me. You know, from time to time when I think about this, I think about my life then. I lived for the party. Full, I was full of anger. I wanted to fight people. But the night he saved me, and I remember, I think, those of you that's got prodigals, I can remember nights, and again, I say this to my shame and not my glory. I remember nights coming in my house I, I couldn't even walk straight. And it'd be 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm banging into walls. I can remember a couple of times I knocked lamps over. Broke them while I'm groping through the dark. And to go upstairs and I'm trying to find my bed and to hear them. 3 o'clock in the morning. I heard them. Save our boys, Lord. Save our boys. I couldn't escape that. I don't care what they look like. I don't care the smile they give you. I don't care how they act. They can't get away from it. They can't. And he saved me. Somebody like me. Somebody said I was a plague on the church. One parent. Another parent talked about how they tried to keep all their, their sons and daughters away from me. But... But somebody like me, he saved. And I want to tell you something. I don't care what you've done or where you've been. He loves somebody like you. He does. And that, and that Sunday night that he came into my life, and everything changed. I mean, everything changed. How I talked changed. How I walked changed. 
How I viewed life changed. The things I wanted changed. Everything changed. And it wasn't because of somebody else's influence. It wasn't because somebody said, this is what you need to do. It was because somebody loved me enough to change me from the inside out. And by the way, he's still doing that today with whosoever will call upon his name. Jesus. How do, you, how do you get unstuck? Well, you got to understand the Holy Spirit, and you got to understand the Holy Son. Hallelujah to God forever. And I think I'm just going to help myself this morning because I feel it. I just want to brag on Jesus. I want to preach Jesus. Every once in a while I do that here and I, I, because I, I just don't want to do that all the time. I could. But I, Jesus, I don't know what kind of Jesus you're following after. I don't know what, what, how, you, how you feel about Jesus. I don't know what he looks like or is like to you. But I tell you, when I look in that book, he's been that and everything and so much more to me. In Genesis 3.15, way back, way back when sin entered the world, way back then, God said to the serpent, there's going to come a seed of woman that's going to crush your head. Hello, Jesus. Uh, and you're going to bruise his heel. Uh, in Genesis 49, 10, the Bible said that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh was come. In Exodus chapter 12, uh, the Bible tells us that the plague was coming across the land uh, and God instructed the people to get a lamb, one lamb per family. And if it was a small family, two families could come together. They would take the lamb and they would, they would offer up the lamb and they would catch the blood of the lamb and they were instructed to paint the blood around their door and on their door so that when the death angel passed by, they would be spared and protected. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why you've made it through so much when you didn't know how it was going to happen. Let me tell you why when you felt like you had no hope that suddenly everything changed. Let me tell you why when you almost lost your mind but you didn't. You've been covered by the blood of a spotless sacrifice. Hallelujah. Leviticus chapter 14, God's speaking to Moses. And he says to Moses, we're, we're gonna, this is what we're going to do to cleanse the leper. And he was to go out and get a cedar. That was a type of wooden handle. And a scarlet, which was a kind of string. And a hyssop plant, which was bushy and prominent in that area. And they would take the cedar and tie it to the plant. And the bushy plant on the end was to be, the Bible said they went out and got two birds alive and clean. That's the sacrifice. Alive and clean. <laughs> How many of you know that sounds like the sacrifice that God gave for us, Jesus? They killed one of them in an earthen vessel and caught the blood. And they were instructed to dip that entire concoction into the blood. And they were to sprinkle upon him that was to be cleansed seven times. That's God's complete number. That's his perfection number. And that's what happens when the blood gets applied to you. I'm having a malfunction, but you know what? I think I'll just put it in my pocket and it'll be all right. And then tucked in that text is this comment that said the living bird was loosed into the open field. There's the resurrection. Jesus is all through the book. In Psalm 61 and 2, he said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I am. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in the storm in the middle of the night uh, and fear tried to invade your life, uh, but you found a hiding place? Uh, that's Jesus Christ. Uh, I look in the book and I saw in Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 1, he's there, the rose of Sharon uh, and the lily of the valley. Uh, in the Song of Solomon chapter 5 and verse 16. There he is, the altogether lovely one. In Isaiah 9 and 6, he's wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. In Isaiah 11 and 10, the Bible said there would be a root of Jesse that would stand for an incense to the people and said that the Gentiles would also seek after him. In Isaiah 53, there he is, the suffering righteous servant 
who gave himself for our iniquities and for our transgressions and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. I look and I read about him and Hosea. There the Bible said in chapter 2 verse 15 that in the valley of Achor, in the valley of trouble, there is a door of hope. Hallelujah. Hello Jesus. In Zechariah 13 and 1, the Bible said in that day, there shall be a fountain open under the house of David for sin and for uncleanness. How many of you have been to that fountain? The Bible said in Malachi 4 and 2, under them that fear my name shall the son of righteousness rise with healing in his wings. And, and then you step into the New Testament. And this is what the Bible said about him. In Matthew 2 and 6, he's the governor that would rule over God's people. And then in Mark 1, 24, he's called the son of God. In Luke 1, 69, he's the horn of my salvation. In Luke 1, 78, he's the day from on high. In John 1 and 1, he is the word. In John 1, 14, he's the word that became flesh. In John 1 and 20, he said behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world John 1 and 34 the Bible called him the Son of God in John 1 41 he is the Messiah that is interpreted Christ or the anointed one in John 6 35 he said I'm the bread of life and whoever comes to me should never hunger and he that believes on me shall never thirst in John 8 and 12 he simply said I am the light of the world in John 8 58 I love this he was talking about Abraham and those people around him said what do you know about Abraham you're not even 50 years old you know what Jesus said he said before Abraham was I am. Hallelujah to God. That's who I'm talking about. John 10 and 14, he's the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five, he called himself the resurrection and the life. John 14 and 6, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man gets to the Father but by me. I don't care what your co-worker says. I don't care what your family member says. I don't care what that book that you read said. There is only one way to God. There's not many gods. There is one God, and there's only one way to him, and his name is Jesus Christ, who is the son of the living God. In John 15 and 5, he's the living vine. In Acts 3:15, he's the prince of life. In Acts 10, 36, he is the Lord of all. In Ephesians 1 and 20, he's the head of the church. In Ephesians 2, 22, he's the chief cornerstone. In 2 Timothy 4 and 8, the Bible said he is the righteous judge. In the Bible said in Hebrews 8 and 6 he said I am the mediator of a new covenant in Hebrews 12 and 2 he is the author and the finisher of our faith hallelujah to God forever then when you get in the book of Revelation there he is in Revelation 1 and 8 Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end he which is which was and which is to come the almighty and John said a few verses later in verse 17 of Revelation 1 when I saw saw his face I fell at his feet like a dead man but he laid his right hand on me and said fear not I am the first and the last I am he that liveth and was dead and looky behold I am alive forevermore and have the keys of death and of hell. In Revelation 5 and 5, he's the line of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. In Revelation 19, 16, he's king of all kings and lord of lords. In Revelation 22, 20, he is our very soon coming king. He is everything you need him to be. He is typified throughout the Bible. He was Jacob's ladder. He's Elijah's mantle. He was the fire that fell on Carmel. He's the healing balm of Gilead. He's a friend that's this closer than a brother. He's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And let's not talk about him like he's not here. He's here right now. He is in this place. That's how come you can be healed by the power of God Almighty. I don't know how we do it. But in spite of all that, we get stuck and we get misguided and we got to do what Elisha did because Elijah said 
I'm not staying here. I'm going to Bethel. He said, I'm going to go to Bethel. Elisha did, and they go to Bethel. But what is significant about Bethel? Genesis chapter 28 and Genesis chapter 35. Jacob made a decision, and he was changed. How do you move out of stuck places? You got to make a decision to be changed. It's not rocket science. What does that look like? If you go back to Genesis 35, you see the instructions that God gave to Jacob. Verse 1, he told him, go back to where I first appeared to you. Go back to where we started. You guys remember, I don't know, a couple of years ago maybe, we were down in Hamilton. Standing with my boys and we went to the church where I was saved. I don't remember who's, who owned it at the time. We went in there and acted like we owned it. Nobody said anything to us. <laughs> and I went in the old sanctuary there on Princeton Pike. And I walked them down there. And I took them right to the place. Right here. This is where my story with him right. began with me participating right here. You remember, you remember that? Right here. Now, I don't necessarily have to go back to that geographic location. But there comes a time in your life where you need to go back to that place when you, di when you didn't know everything. <laughs> Do you remember that? Go back there. Go back there when you wasn't quite as spiritual as you are right now. Go back to that place where you were just broken, sinful humanity. On your way to hell. Go back to that place. God said to Jacob, I want you to go back where I first appeared to you. And then the second thing he said to him in verse 2 of that chapter, I want you to get rid of the strange gods that you put in your house. Now we're living in a day where compromise is paralyzed. A lot of churches and a lot of believers. We have forgotten what holiness is. We have forgotten what purity is. And too many people have created their own God that agrees with everything they believe instead of vice versa. And God told Jacob, you got to cleanse your house. My brothers and sisters, every so often you need to take inventory of what's going on in your house. Oh, I know we don't like this. Now, you all were shouting when I was preaching Jesus and, and, and be ye holy as he is holy. And without holiness, no man shall see God. You ought not stop shouting now. He said, said Jacob, you got to rid your house of these strange gods, these things that you've put on the level of God. You got to get rid of that. And then a couple of verses later, he told him, you need to build an altar. So go back, get rid of things, and build again an altar. A place of communion with God. A place where you become a living sacrifice on the altar before God. And then in verse 10, he was changed from Jacob to Israel. Been easy to stay in Gilgal. But when you come to that place of Bethel, it's a place that requires a decision to be changed. When change comes, that, does, that means things aren't going to be like they always were. We get comfortable with how things are. But if you want to be changed, go back to where you started. Get rid of the junk that's attached itself to you. Rebuild an altar and be transformed. 
And you know what? You'll never do it. I, I went through a time here some time back. I was preaching out of Acts chapter 16 when Paul was at Philippi and the little demon-possessed damsel began to chase after him and say, hey, everybody, these are servants of the Most High. And, and it went on, the Bible said, for many days until what happened? Paul was grieved. One translation said he was irritated. I like that word. You know, Andre Fancel, I believe, is a prophet from God. He prophesied over me one day and said, oh, you get irritated. I like that word because I do. I get irritated about things. That was one translation of that word grieved, irritated. One translation said he was worn out with it. One translation said he was fed up. One translation said he was greatly annoyed. When's the last time you got annoyed about something in your life that was not of God? Because you never will. Listen, we never will change as long as we're willing to tolerate what is not of God in our lives. But the, but the moment in time that you've had enough of it, the moment in time you've had a belly full of it, the moment in time when you are not willing to go another day with it, something will change in you. And the Bible said when he got to that point and he was irritated and fed up and all those things, he turned around and addressed the issue. He cast the devil out of the, out of the little girl and everything changed. Not sent him to jail, but they went in there and had a revival, right? People got saved because of that. But at some point in time, you got to decide, I am so weary of not praying like I ought to. I'm so weary of rubbing shoulders with walking dead people every day that are on their way to hell and having no feeling toward it. I'm just tired of not being full of love. I'm tired and whatever it might be. At that point in time, transformation begins to come. Now watch what happened. Elijah said, I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to Jericho. Oh. Jericho. We all know Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and he was in Gilgal in Joshua chapter 5. On the eve of conquering 31 kings and 10 major military campaigns, Jericho was the first. On the eve of that, there he was. And what I begin to learn, when you make a decision that you're going to change, and you're going to seek to be everything God wants you to be, and you're going to get rid of some of the stuff that's attached itself to you, you know what's coming? There's a war coming. There's a battle coming. And I want to tell you, and I'm no different than you are. I think back to nights that I fought demonic influence. When I couldn't sleep through the night. What you've got to get is on the other side of that war is a bonanza for you. On the, on the other side of that war is some magnificent thing that God is doing and that he's destined for your life. But the war has got to be fought. But here's what I want you to see. Before Joshua ever went in against Jericho, he looks over and there in Gilgal, and they've decided we're going, here stands a man. And he's got a drawn sword. Now, Jericho's a, or, or Joshua's a warrior, so he didn't shy away. He marches right over there to this man. And he says, are you for us or are you against us? And he said, I am the captain of the Lord's host. Take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. And you know what? You don't read anything more about the captain of the Lord's host. But what you read about is walls falling flat down. What you read about is extraordinary victory. The captain of the Lord's host, along with the Lord's host, was there all the time. But what you've got to understand, before the battle ever gets going, he's already there. Hallelujah to God forever. That's why the ball, come on, you're not listening to me. I said before your battle gets started, he is already there. 
why Hebrews 13 and 5, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew 28, 20, he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. In Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 1, he said, fear not, I'm with you. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And the rivers, they will not overflow you. And even when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Hallelujah. And even Psalm 23, 4, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because you are are with me. Come on, somebody, and say thank you, Jesus. Before the battle ever gets started, what time is it? I don't know how long I've been preaching. Oh, no, today's dangerous for you. Don't say that. Does anybody know what time it is? Okay, look, I got, I got all day left. I'm getting ready to land a plane here in a minute. But here's what you need to understand. Trouble, how, how many of you know Trouble's part of life. Days full of trouble. That's what life is, according to wise man. Trouble. Man, if I would have turned around every time I had trouble in my life, I wouldn't have went anywhere. Psalm 27, verse 1 said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came on me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. And though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. This one thing have I desired, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to inquire in his temple, to behold his beauty. For in the time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and he will set me up upon a rock. Psalm 32 and 7, he said, Thou art my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. Psalm 37 39 said, The salvation of the righteous is of the Lord, and he is their help in the time of trouble. In Psalm 54 and 7, David testifies, and he says, the Lord has delivered me out of all of my trouble. In Psalm 59, 16, I'll sing aloud of your power in the morning, for you have been my refuge and you've been my defense in the day of my trouble. In Psalm 125, said in verse 1, they that trust in the Lord shall be like Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever and forever. Trouble is always going to come when we live in this earth. But thank God the King of glory is with me before it starts. He is with me in the midst of it. He is with me on the other side of it. Come on, he said, I am going to Jericho. Because on the other side of Jericho, Elijah says, I'm not staying in Jericho. Dear Lord, give us ears to hear that. You know, I remember, I always think of this. When I first preached, I was an evangelist, and I got invited back to churches, and I'd preach some churches every year. And I remember going to church, and I'll never forget it. It, it. Then, it probably would have passed out of my mind, but the lady came, and, brother, pray for me, because I'm being tested. So we prayed, and she shouted, and I went back a year later, same church. Same lady, brother, pray for me. I'm being tested. Okay, we pray, she shouts, she's blessed. The third year, same lady, brother, pray for me because I'm being tested. The fourth year, I'm thinking this is enough. Same lady, brother, I don't know if you remember me, but pray for me because I'm being tested. And I says this, let me... Uh, can I borrow your Bible, Rhonda? I said, let me, let me help you with this. I said, you've been tested, but here's the good news. You can pass the test. And it's an open book test for you. Now, this is, this is what I know. Thank you. I know that there's a lot of people who love to live in the drama. I know we don't have any here at the Potter's house, but I'm talking to some other people. 
They love to live in the drama. They stay in Jericho. They live in Jericho. They talk Jericho. That's all it's about is trouble for them. Baby, the invitation is come on. Let's go to Jordan. You don't have to stay in Jericho. And so they come to Jordan, and the sons of the prophets are still watching, the Bible said. And Elijah is walking with Elisha. And they come to the Jordan River. And Elijah takes that mantle. And he leans back and he smites the Jordan. And the water starts moving. Now Elisha's watching all this. He's watching the river, the Jordan River push back. And Elijah's like, come on. You know, he's walking across the river on dry land. Now can you imagine seeing that? And then Elijah looks at Elisha. And says, what can I do for you? (laughs) What would you have said? What can I do for you? He said, I want twice the spirit that's on you. Mm. Come walk with me. The younger Elisha watches the water split and they're walking across. Elisha's in wonderment of what he's just seen. And Elijah says, what can I do for you? And Elisha said, I want twice what's on you. And they walk on, and Elijah says to him, oh, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, don't you love the neverthelesses of the Bible? He said, but nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken up from you, it's going to happen. Elisha, if you can see it, you can have it. And the two walked on. And suddenly the fiery chariots of the Lord came and split them asunder. And Elijah is taken up. His mantle is on the ground. And here stands Elisha that in these moments has walked through the Jordan, has said to the man of God, I want twice what's on you. And now the fire has come down. Elijah is going up, and Elisha cries out to God. He said, my father, my father. And when the word is used, cried, you study this yourself. It's not a lamentation. It is a declaration. He is declaring to God, my father, my father, the horses and chariots of the Lord. So you said if I could see it, I could have it. And he walks over and picks up the mantle of Elijah. And he turns around. How many of you know you got to see it before it happens? That's faith. This is all faith. Do you know, I remember dragging people out here when this was a forest. And we built this first building over here. I had people, I'd say, let me show you something. And we'd be stepping through sticker bushes and around trees and pushing through things. And people wondering, what are you doing? And we got out there, and I got about right here. And I said, get around that tree, come here. And what? I said, right here. Best I can tell, I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ from right here and touch this world. And people are going to get saved right here where you're standing. You know, they're all looking at you like, you know, we're in a forest. This isn't good. Ticks are getting all over. Snakes are out here. But you got to see it before you can have it. They couldn't see it, but I saw it before it happened. You've got to see it before you can have it. But dear God, when you see it, you can have it. And he goes over and he picks up that mantle. It's invisible right now. And And he goes back over to the same Jordan River. And he leans back. 
And he cried, that's it, I want you to. And he cried out, where? He's the God of Elijah. And then he leaned back and he smote the water. Can you imagine Elisha standing there now and he starts seeing the water moving? He'd never had that before. Something has changed. Something has happened. And he goes marching off on dry land across the Jordan into a ministry that would radically change his life and God would give him two times the miracles that was on the life of Elijah. He said, if you see it, uh, you can have it. Thank you. you. If you see it, you can have it. It can be yours. I don't know what you're believing God for. I don't know what mountain's in front of you, but I tell you in the name of Jesus Christ, I know this is true. If you see it, yeah. you can have it. I want you to shout out loud, I can see it. I can see it. Hey, 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 hey. You act like you believe that. Say it again, I can see it. I want you to lift your hands to heaven right now. And if you've got something in your life, listen, you may be stuck. It's time to get unstuck. You, you might be in the process of getting unstuck. It's time to go and get ready for the fight. You're going to win. Don't worry, because the man with the drawn sword is right there beside you. Or you might be in the war right now. Come on, get out of there and get on to Jordan, because there's something God's got for you. But I want you to lift your hands up to him, and I want you to tell him right now, Lord, I can see it. Through eyes of faith, I can see it. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Ah, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith faith. Father, I speak blessings today on this people. Lord, on those that dare to believe you, on those, Lord, even some in the face of impossibility, they dare to believe you. Lord, we're going to the Jordan one more time. We're going to the Jordan again. Lord, we believe you. We're not limited, Father, by anything around us, but our eyes are upon you. And it's all about you. And we give you glory and honor. And Lord, any good thing that is in any of us, it's because of your wonderful grace. It's because of your wonderful blessing. But here we are again, Lord. Bring us to another Jordan. We'll go through it, Father. We'll go through it believing. We'll go through it in the name of Jesus. All for your glory. And we pray that, Father, with faith and expectation. In the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody that believes that for your own life, I want you to shout amen. amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it again one more time. Amen. Shout it. Yeah.